Some of you say, wait a minute, we were there last week, and you're right. So <laughs> get to finish the story this morning, Isaiah chapter 6. Welcome, by the way, to Selfless Sunday. We're not going to leave you hanging with self e Sunday, so hopefully you're able to, you remember to bring some food for our friends at Youth Hope. Uh, if you just forgot but want to, uh, bring some by early in the week. Uh, we'll just drop it by the church office, we'll make sure we, we pass it along, but uh, it's a way for us to look outside of ourselves and into the community. And how cool is it to see the teams that we're sending overseas this summer? I mean, that is, that is exciting. Yeah. So we certainly want, to, certainly want to keep praying. You either go, pray, or send, right? And so we're, we're going to be praying. We're going to be sending. I know a lot of you, your mailboxes have been filled with support letters already. Uh, we're going to help uh, these people go on our behalf to take the gospel uh, into different parts of the world. Well, let's pray together, and then, oh, oh, before we do that, next week, next week's cool. Next week is Sunday, Sunday. Isn't that fun? What this means is it's Sunday with an A-E. We're doing ice cream Sundays out on the, the plaza in between services, uh, but not only that, it's just like the big celebration at the end of the Follow Me series. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to be celebrating with those who are being baptized uh, next Sunday morning. We're going to baptize on the Sunday morning uh, during the service and uh, just have a great time of worship uh, and, and, and just rejoicing in what the Lord has done throughout this Follow Me series. So we're looking forward to that. Well, let's pray together, and then we'll turn our hearts and minds to the Word of God. Thank you, Father, that we can come together as your people. And we looked last week how you've called us for your glory, a, a people that you have formed to declare your praise, that we are the people of God. We are the body of Christ. But Father, you have not called us just to come together. You called us to go out on mission for you. And I pray that as we work through your calling of Isaiah, Father God, that some of these truths would burn into our hearts, that we would be the men and women of God on mission that you have not only called us to be, but empowered us to be. So use your word in our lives this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2011... A reporter from Christianity Today asked Billy Graham this question, what are the most important issues facing evangelicals today? This was his answer. The most important issue we face today is the same the church has faced in every century. Will we reach our world for Christ? In other words, will we give priority to Christ's command to go into all the world and preach the gospel? Or will we turn increasingly inward, caught up in our own internal affairs and controversies, or simply become more and more comfortable with the status quo? Will we become inner-directed or outer-directed? The central issues of our time are not economic or political or social, important as these are. The central issues of our time are moral and spiritual in nature, and our calling is to declare Christ's forgiveness and hope and transforming power to a world that does not know him or follow him. May we never forget this. So as we look at Isaiah 6 this morning, it's, it's from, from this idea that God is calling us into mission. Now we're going to look specifically at the commissioning of Isaiah this morning. And obviously there are some differences. This is God speaking to an Old Testament prophet somewhere in the, the mid-700s B.C. with a specific task. But we're also going to see quite a few similarities of how we respond to our commissioning to go into all the world and make disciples. And may we never forget this. May we never forget that this is the business that we have been sent out to do. So let's start reading in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he threw, flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Now this is the part of the chapter we looked at last week, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. But I want you to notice from the very beginning that before there's a commissioning into mission, 
Before Isaiah is sent, we see him experiencing worship. And worship precedes mission. It is through this vision of seeing God, this worshiping God. And we talked last week, how do we see God? We see him on the throne, and we see that he is worthy of worship. And, and the, the picture that we're given here is the Lord seated high and exalted, surrounded by these creatures. Now the word seraphim literally means burning ones. That Isaiah looked at these creatures with their six wings, and all he could come up with to describe them is, it, it, it's like they're on fire. They're, they're just blazing in, in, in their presence. But you see this humility because with two of the wings they covered their face, with two of the wings they covered their feet, with two they flew. But you also notice that they're, they're flying, but, but, but they're in the position of standing. It's kind of interesting. In, in verse 2, above him stood the seraphim. Here's the image. If you've got someone on a throne and people standing off to the side, it's the position of a servant. If, if we were to be invited into the home of this extremely wealthy person with servants and butlers and maids and, and, and all of that, and, and we sit down for dinner, the position we're going to see the servants in is standing off to the side, right? Just waiting to, to take a plate or to fill a drink or, 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 or bring us more food. That they would be there standing to serve. This is the image that God is on the throne and you've got these burning creatures with six wings standing to serve. And they called to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now some read this holy, holy, holy and think it's maybe a veiled reference to the Trinity, but, but the best way to understand it is, is it's kind of a, a magnification through repetition. That God is, is not just holy. He's holy, holy. He's not just holy, holy, but he's holy, holy, holy. In the Hebrew, it's a way of saying he is very, very holy. And the whole earth is full of his glory. And so this is the, this is the worship that Isaiah is able to enter into. I also want you to notice he's unapproachable in his holiness. You see, there's this theme of, of fullness we see that it's the, the hem of his garment that, that fills the temple. We see that the whole earth is filled with his glory. We see that the smoke filled the room. And notice that when the voice spoke, Isaiah says it's the foundations of the threshold that were shaking. The idea here is that, that God's presence just fills up the room. And here's Isaiah cowering at the threshold, not fully able to enter the room because God is holy and he fills the entire space. And so this leads us from worship, which always precedes mission, into confession. And this is being prepared for the mission that Isaiah falls on his face before God and all he can say is, woe is me. We pick that up in verse 5. Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Do you catch this humility? <laughs> He's just, woe is me. I don't belong here. By the way, this is in contrast the chapter begins by talking about the year that King Uzziah died, which was somewhere around 740 B.C. But in the year that King Uzziah died, now if you go back, we won't turn there, but jot it down if you want to go back and read it. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 26 kind of gives us the story of King Uzziah. And he was a good king, successful king, a prosperous king. But something happened as he grew strong. These are tragic words that... Some of the words you don't want on your tombstone, but listen to what it says in verse 16 of 2 Chronicles 26. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. That as he grew in strength and the nation grew in strength, pride crept in to his destruction. 
And what this looked like for King Uzziah was, was, was one day presuming the role of a priest, coming into the temple to burn incense on the altar. And at that time, some 80 priests were running after him saying, King Uzziah, don't do this. Instead of listening or repenting in his pride, he grew angry. And we read that as soon as he got angry, leprosy started breaking out on his forehead. And King Uzziah, who in his great strength grew proud, spent the rest of his life in isolation as a leper. You know, the Bible's clear that God exalts the humble. But, it, but, it, but he brings down. Pride comes before what? A fall, right? And so this is what we see. It's, it's in his pride, it led to his destruction. But then you see Isaiah humbling himself before God. J. Oswald Sanders in his book, Spiritual Leadership, says that humility is the hallmark of the man of God. And here's Isaiah. Before he's being launched into mission, he's got to learn what it means to be humble. It's so always bowing before God saying, woe is me. And of all things, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I read that and think, is that the best you got? You see, I grew up as a church kid and I always thought my, my faith story was so boring. Because I didn't have this great story of things I was involved in. And I, I, I take great comfort in the fact that Isaiah is here saying, I'm a man of unclean lips. I mean, he's not saying, woe is me, for I have like murdered and committed adultery and sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I've sinned with my lips. I've lied, I've gossiped. I, I don't know exactly what he means by that, but it doesn't seem like one of the big sins, does it? But understand this, there's something about a full view of the holiness of God. It just magnifies whatever sin is in our life. And here's this time of confession. Of saying, I'm completely undone because my lips are not clean. I love the response. Then one of, in verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. A little play on words. One of the burning ones brings a burning coal that he had taken from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. These are words of redemption. He's saying because of the, the cleansing presence of this coal from the altar, your sin is atoned. It, it, it's covered. Atonement means a covering. Your debt is covered. And your guilt has been taken away. You see, we read these words on this side of the cross and we think to Jesus. Because this is, I mean, this is the gospel right here. That we come humbly before God. Recognizing our sin because we've caught a glimpse of His holiness and that we don't measure up. And we don't look for like a, a burning angel with a coal to put on us. What we look to is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and see that the full wrath of God was placed on Jesus on the cross. And He was there in our place taking our punishment. And when we place our faith in Him, when we say, we humble ourselves by saying, woe is me, I am undone, I am lost because of the sin in my life. Then we look to Jesus and find our atonement. The one who died in our place. Not only does He say your sin is atoned for, but He says your guilt is taken away. That you are declared not guilty, Isaiah. And this is what we see at the cross, that it's not just our sin, but it's our guilt. It's our shame. Everything is placed on Christ on the cross. And because of that, we, we are justified, which means we have a right standing before God. It's the legal word that you once were guilty and condemned, but now you are justified because your price has been paid. But if we keep reading, here's what we're going to see, that our salvation is not just a matter of being declared not guilty in a judicial sense, but we're also reconciled into relationship. This is why the Bible uses words like adoption and father. We're welcomed into the family. 
And it's intriguing in Isaiah 6 that when you get to the next verse, after he's been declared not guilty, your sin atoned for, verse 8, and I heard the voice of the Lord. Have, have you noticed up to this point, the posture of Isaiah was, I'm, I'm towering at the threshold. I'm not hearing God speak. I'm hearing the seraphim speak to each other. But once he has been forgiven, once his guilt is taken away, now he hears the voice of God. And in the same way, there's a sense, there's a judicial side of becoming a Christ follower, which means you once were guilty, but you're declared not guilty because of what Christ has done. But you're also declared part of the family and adopted as sons and daughters. Well, then God speaks, and we begin to see the commission at this point. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Now, anytime I read this passage, I think of like a second grade classroom, and the one kid who really knows the answer. You got that image? Okay, I'm as old as dirt, at least some of you think so. But those of us that are my age and older used to watch this show called Welcome Back, Cotter. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? Who am I talking about? Horseshack, right? You remember Horseshack? Ooh, ooh, ooh. This is the picture I get. I picture Isaiah looking like Horseshack at this point, okay? And so if, if you're too young to get it, just Google it. It's on YouTube, I'm sure. You'll, you'll figure it out. And then you'll think, man, that looks really old. <laughs> anyway, here's Isaiah saying, here I am, send me, let me be the one to go. And, and to me, this scene just cracks me up a little bit because there are no other humans in the room. Like God's saying, who will I send? Who will go for me? <laughs> me, me, me. Yeah, maybe you, the only one here. You know. <laughs> but notice what he's doing. I mean, there's a funny side of that, but here's what he's saying. He's saying, God, you, you talk about a blank check. Giving your life as a blank check. Do you notice what he didn't do? He didn't say, okay, I have a couple of questions. Where are you sending? What is it you want me to do? God just says, who will I send? Who will I go? And Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. Don't look for anybody. I'll go. And then God says, okay, verse 9, go and say this to the people. And this is the most unusual commissioning ever. Keep on hearing. Here's what to say to the people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. What? What? It's, it's this idea, and, and I don't think God was saying go out and be deceptive. I think he was saying you're going to go out and preach. Here's what I'm calling you to do, to go out and speak my words. But guess what? They're not going to hear with their ears. They're not going to see with their eyes. They're not going to understand in their hearts. But I want you to go and communicate my word to these people that will not soften their hearts. That the more you preach and the more you share the word, the more their hearts are going to be hardened. If they would soften their hearts, they could return and be healed, but that's not what's going to happen. So go. Now, I, I look at this and think, why would you sign up for that? Why would you say, God, here's a blank check. I'll do whatever you want, even if it means I'm going to go talk to people that aren't going to listen. Well, from this passage, I think we see two key reasons why you would say, here I am, send me. The first is this, is, is, is you do it out of worship. That Isaiah had seen this vision of God, high and exalted on the throne. And worship propels you into mission. And once you've seen the holiness of God, the glory of God, you have no choice other than to go. I've been privileged during the last few years, to, to go to a few Urbana conferences. And I will never forget one of the speakers getting up several, two or three Urbanas ago, so it's been a few years. But the speaker got up and talked, really challenging the students. What do you say when you're summoned by the king? Because this is what we read. My eyes 
have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And when the king says go, there's only one response. And that's this. This is what the speaker challenged them at Urbana, just to look and say, yes, your majesty. That we put ourselves in a place of saying, God, I'll do whatever you want. Yes, your majesty. And we do it out of worship. Because he's the king. And we live our lives in worship to him, even if it means, God, you, you just say, you just send and, and, and I'll go. I'm, I'm the blank check waiting for you to just fill it out. So, so out of worship, we say, yes, your majesty, because we understand who God is. But also out of gratitude. You've you, you got to remember that Isaiah was just a couple of verses to go on his face before God saying, woe is me, I am undone, I am unworthy. And now he's been declared worthy. He has a right standing before God. He's in relationship where he's listening to God. And out of gratitude for God's work in your life, you join in mission. So why would we challenge you to say, God, here's a blank check with my life. Because the worship of God demands that we say, yes, your majesty. And the gratitude of those of us who have been forgiven and set free and made clean and reconciled to God, that that should propel us. Worship and gratitude. And it's a desire for all people to worship. And it's a desire for all people to be forgiven and set free. That they would experience God's work in their lives the way that we have in ours as Christ followers. So he's willing to say, God, this doesn't sound very fun, but you know what? I have seen you, and I'm saying, yes, your majesty, and I'm going to follow in the mission that you've called me to. So I'm not surprised with how the next verse starts, verse 11, because Isaiah speaks three times in this passage. First time he speaks, he says, woe is me, I'm lost. Second time he speaks, he says, here am I, send me. And then when he heard about the mission, he speaks one more time and says, How long? How long, O oh Lord? Because here's what happens. We may respond to the mission. We may respond to the call of God. Of, hey, we need, to, we need to join his work of making disciples of all people. And then suddenly we get there and we realize, this is hard. And the key here is to persevere in our calling, to not grow weary in well-doing, to not lose heart as we follow God in his mission. Now, when Isaiah asked, how long, O Lord, there's really kind of two questions. One is, how long is this going to happen? How long are you going to harden people's hearts? And the next question is, how long do I have to do this? How long until this is over? God gives a cheerful answer to that. He says, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Okay, God, that's not really what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Here's the idea. People are going to hear the word but not respond until eventually because of their unfaithfulness and they, they've broken my covenant, their land is going to be destroyed. They're going to be removed and lived in exiles in another land and, and their land is going to be wiped out. Now to, to get this, you need to understand a little bit of context in the Old Testament. And looking around the room, some of you are brilliant Bible scholars, but not all of you. So let's kind of walk through the Old Testament. I'll need some help with this, okay? This is the interactive part of what we're doing. Let's walk through the story of the Old Testament to, to get to this context. In the beginning, God did what? Created. I say, you are so good. This is perfect. So spoke things into existence. He created two people. Their names were Adam and Eve. Good. Adam and Eve, the big thing they did wrong, they took a bite of the fruit, bringing about what we call the fall. Right, okay? So they were barred from the garden. Sin passed upon all people. They populated the planet with sinful people until finally God said, that's enough. And he sent what? 
the flood. You're so good at this. So he sent the flood, destroyed everything. Fast forward a few years and suddenly earth is being repopulated again and God selects one man through which he's going to make a great nation and bless all the nations of the world. His name is... Hmm. Is that the right answer? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Abram or Abraham. <laughs> and then we enter this time of the patriarchs. We see Abraham followed by Isaac, followed by Jacob. That's good. And then Jacob had way too many kids, um, which is what happens when you have way too many wives. <laughs> but anyway, he had way too many kids. The favored one with the technicolor dream coat is Joseph. You got that one. And as Joseph's story plays out, he ends up in Egypt. Remember what man meant for evil, God meant for good. And the whole family ends up moving to Egypt, which becomes a nation, a great people. And in the midst of that, they eventually, a pharaoh came that did not know Joseph, and they became what in Egypt? Slaves. Well, fast forward several hundred years, and it was time, God said, to get them out of slavery. Someone to say, let my people go. So he sent Moses. <laughs> I did it again. This is, this is his staff, I think. I, <laughs> some reason when I say Moses, I have to do this. Like he's banging that staff. He sent Moses. Ten plagues. Passover. Crosses the Red Sea. They're celebrating until the wheels fall off because they disobey again. They complain. They're wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. They finally move into the promised land, not being led by Moses, but being led by Joshua. Good. Come into the promised land. There's a series of judges. Anyone want to name them? Uh, just kidding. There's a series of judges and prophets that God sends to lead until finally they cry out, give us a king. And there were three kings that, that, that ruled over the United Kingdom. Their names were Saul, David, Solomon, right? After the reign of Solomon, there was a division, a civil war. There's a northern kingdom. The northern kingdom is known as Israel. The southern kingdom is known as Judah. Okay, now we're, we're starting to get closer to Isaiah here. So here, here's the grand story that leads us here. The northern kingdom, Israel, never had any godly kings. They were all evil. They, 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 they never walked in obedience to the Lord. Around the year 722, which is a little bit after the year that King Uzziah died, they were destroyed by who? Assyrians, just say it, you're right. <laughs> say it with confidence. The Assyrians came in, wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel, and they never returned as a nation, which left the southern kingdom of Judah. The capital of Judah was the city known as Jerusalem, right? It wasn't until the year 586 B.C. that they were conquered by what people? The Babylonians, Right? So, and, and the, the end of the Old Testament story is that they went to live, as this talks about, in exile. That the cities were desolate. The places were laid waste. Everything was destroyed. The people lived in exile. But the Old Testament ends with God bringing the exiles back into Jerusalem, into Judah. And it's here we read that through Zerubbabel and Ezra, they built the temple. And someone, please remember what Nehemiah built the wall, right? Okay, <laughs> built the wall around the city. God brought his people back to the land. Okay, so here's what Isaiah is here. God is saying, I'm going to destroy because of, they broke my covenant, the unfaithfulness, the stiff-necked people. Judgment is coming upon Judah. And it's coming through the Babylonians. So I want you to go and I want you to preach to people who aren't going to understand because my goal is that I'm going to destroy the nation in judgment. So Isaiah, I want you to persevere. I want you to be faithful to the calling and understand this. What does success in ministry look like for Isaiah? Is it a big building? Is it a huge congregation? What does success in ministry look like for Isaiah? Isaiah. It's to be faithful, right? And to keep talking. And I say this because we're hearing this challenge straight from the Word of God to go into all the world and make disciples. 
Did you realize you could spend your whole life sharing the gospel with people in other nations and also sharing the gospel with your neighbors and the people you work with? And you may get to the end of your life and say, I told the story so many times and no one came to Christ. I must be a failure. What God is asking of us is to be faithful in the midst of this. Faithful to the calling to make disciples of all nations. It's interesting because on one side we have this command to go make disciples of all nations, but we also hear Jesus saying, narrow is the gate and straight is the way. A few are those that enter. I mean, Jesus said most people aren't going to follow me. He tells stories about farmers and seeds and soil and you get to the end of the day and there's not much that lands on good soil. point is we need to be faithful to our calling. The results are up to God and the Holy Spirit. But we're called to be faithful, to be on mission. So I ask us, why would we do this? I think it comes back to the same things we've seen here. We join the mission out of worship for God because God sends. We see God. We have a view of God that's worthy of God. So we respond by saying, yes, your majesty. I will follow with this. We do this out of gratitude that we are people who were hopelessly lost in our sins that have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and out of gratitude and out of passion for other people to know Jesus, we we joined the mission. We do so in humility. We do so with perseverance that we know it's not always going to be easy and it's going to be challenging, but God has called us and so we go. And it's interesting that Matthew 28 says, go make disciples of all nations, but it's the, the verb tense is as you go. So it's not just going to the nations, it is also going to our neighbors. And as you go to work, and as you live in your neighborhood and in your community, make disciples. Of, this is the mission that God is calling us to. Let me just wrap up by saying that we do this with hope. You get to verse 13. It gives another image of what this destruction is going to look like. And though a tent remain in it, it will be burned again. Like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. It's this picture of this majestic oak tree. The guy's just going to take it out. This is the destruction that's coming. And all, all that's left out of this grand, glorious tree is just this little stump. But notice what he says. The holy seed is its stump. You see, all through the Old Testament, there's this promise of of the remnant. The remnant that God's going to preserve through which he will still bless all people. And it's interesting that he calls this remnant the holy seed. Because this chapter begins with this great view that God is very, very holy, unapproachable in his holiness. And now he says, there's going to be this remnant of people that I call holy. There's going to be a remnant of people that I will not destroy. I will bring back to the land. And it is through them that I will bless all people. But I also want you to notice, in in chapter 11, the idea of a stump is used again. In Isaiah chapter 11, the beginning of the chapter, we read this. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. There's going to be a righteous branch. You get this? Here's the hope. Here's the hope he's given Isaiah. I'm going to destroy everything except for this stump. This stump, this remnant that I'm still going to use to bless all people. And out of this stump, it's going to grow this branch. This righteous branch, the Messiah, is going to come. Here's the hope. I'm calling you to spend your entire life preaching to people who will not hear, listen, or understand. I'm going to wipe out this people, but here's the grand story, Isaiah. I'm going to keep a stump. And out of this stump, I'm going to bring the Messiah, the Savior of all people, who will reign on the throne of David forever and bring salvation to those who put their faith in him. I mean, this is the story. Now, we live on the other side of Messiah. We live here. Our mission is this, to go make disciples of all nations. 
But the great thing is it's not even up to us. Because when Jesus gathered the disciples in Acts chapter 1, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We are empowered for this mission. We have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the authority of the Word of God, through which we go and fulfill the mission that God has called us to fulfill. To make disciples, to take the gospel into all the world. And there's hope for us too, isn't it? And it's not that there's just going to be this stump, although I think it's safe to say Christ's followers will be the minority. Jesus said that. Few are they that enter this straight gate and walk down the narrow road. But we're looking for Messiah, not to come as a baby in Bethlehem, but to return in the clouds with a sword and to gather his people, his holy people, Lost people made holy that he will gather and we will reign with him. And this is why we look at the mission and say, yes, your majesty. We dare not forget it. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this time we've had in your word. Father, we know the mission that you call us to is not always an easy one. But you empower us with your spirit. Give us the authority of your word. And I pray that even as you sent Isaiah to talk to people who would not see, hear, or understand, that we would respond to your call by taking your gospel to the people in our lives. Simply wanting to be humble and faithful servants before you. So Father, we submit before you. We still lift our lives as a blank check and say, use us. Because our heart is just to say, yes, your majesty. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.